Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Podcast brought to you by RaceForThePrize.com Cup Series Texas. Let's review the salaries. Who are the best value plays to explore this weekend? And who are the best point per dollar plays at the top? But first, RaceForThePrize.com. That's where you can go to get access to the Fantasy NASCAR Spreadsheet. Discounted 20 bucks for the rest of April. Venmo, PayPal, cash up the money over to me. Share with me and I get the three Ds. I pay for diapers, daycare, and Mickey D's and support my family. You help me, I help you. You get all the goodies. Go do that now. If not, thanks for joining me anyway. Like the video, subscribe to the video, share the videos. Let's get to it. We'll start at the bottom, work our way to the top. A lot of different drivers to talk about, a lot of drivers on the board. The way that I have them sorted right now in the sheet is based on driver rating over the last five, excluding Coda. I've also got a place sitter projection in for these drivers, similarly based to where they've been running in terms of driver rating. And then also I've pretty much given some hog slash dominator points to the usual suspects just to get, again, just a general idea. I will absolutely change this as the weekend progresses. We see, you know, practice, we see qualifying. The first thing I want to talk about is, all right, where do we stand in terms of viewing this race? Is it going to be a wreck fest? Will it be long green flag runs? If you listen to the podcast earlier in the week, I'm expecting plenty of wrecks. Now, I don't want to labor that point. I think that's been misinterpreted or people are going to take that, not necessarily out of context, but that's not really the issue. So take wrecks aside, big, small, spins, whatever. That's not really what I wanted to say or what I was trying to get across earlier this week. And I think that's been taken in the wrong direction. What I think is very significant is there will be cautions in this race. I'm not saying it's going to be a wreck fest. I'm not saying there's going to be a bunch of wrecks. I believe there will be plenty of cautions, enough cautions. And in this race, there is no tire, two tire, four tire strategies. People stay out. And that creates all kinds of different scenarios in DFS. So... Let's get that clear. You know, could there be long green flag runs? Yes. But could there also be plenty of cautions or enough cautions where strategy comes into play with two tire, four tire, no tire that turns DFS on its head? Yes. So th that's where I st stood earlier this week, and that's still where I stand. I'm not necessarily saying, oh, it's a wreck fest. It's a crazy race. It's a wild track. What I'm saying is there's going to be enough cautions that we're going to have the opportunity for different strategies that open the door to definitely your value plays, which definitely open the door to different lap leaders. That's where I stood early in the week. That's where I stand now. And if that's the case, then really the whole board is in play. <clears throat> we need people to stand the lead lap value-wise to make that work. All right, so obviously, if we sort by rating rank, we're going to get Jimmy Johnson and Austin Hill at the bottom because they have not raced this season. Austin Hill in the 33 for RCR. RCR is not really having a great season. Now they're going to put out a third car. Uh, you know, we'll see about that. I, I, mean, I don't think that can be understated, and that's not an overreaction. Austin Dillon's struggling. Kyle Busch's numbers are not really there, and now they're going to – Put third car driver with limited experience in the next gen car although he is affordable he's not at the top of my list by any means we'll see how he looks in practice but i would have a hard time honestly elevating austin hill above the ricky stenhouse jimmy johnson it's nice to see him at a track other than a road course or a restrictor plate track it's great to see him back at texas where he's won seven times but this is really not even the same track anymore where he won seven times He's not the same driver. He's not with Hendrick. It's easy to get excited. It's easy to click on his name. And if he goes out as fast in practice, people are going to be really heavy on him. But the honest answer is we probably don't want to play him at 6,700. <clears throat> Nemechek hasn't been that fast with Legacy. Jones has shown speed, although he hasn't completely put together complete races. Now they're going to have a third car. Who is the part-time crew chief? It's, uh, what's his name? It's all guys. old crew chief is going to jump in here. Uh, not Burdett, Barnett. Um, and then, so we got Ty Dillon to 5,000. I don't mind. Um, I, you can read into his track history all you want. I don't know if I necessarily want to start punting. 
he did have a decent race finish, but you know, he's running 33rd at Richmond, so I don't think you need to go there. Zane Smith, I've talked about before. This is just the worst car. Trackhouse is not really supporting his venture over at Spire, although they have stepped up a little bit over the last couple weeks. It's really just not somewhere I want to go at an intermediate track where you're going to need pure speed, and I don't think he's going to have the car to compete, although he has been slightly better than Daniel Hemrick and Harrison Burton, which is embarrassing. Burton Hemrick also at a track where you really need good equipment, and Hemrick and Burton haven't had good equipment, and Hemrick and Burton are not running well. I really do not want to have to explore that option. When I ultimately look, can these guys hang on to the lead lap? I can look at driver rating to get a decent idea, and you're going to see numbers in the 30s. I can also get a little bit more clear of a picture if I look at the Dietrich data, where I look at every lap that they run throughout the entire season. And these guys are not even... Like, so if you are above 25, you're at least not in the back quarter of the field. And hey, Harrison Burton in Atlanta is actually almost in the top quarter, which is, you know, 15th place forward. It's Atlanta, so it doesn't matter. But you look here, these guys are not even getting a 10% out of 100. They are not even running above the back, like three or four. These are miserable numbers. They're just nowhere in contention. And I'm going to find it a hard time. I find a hard time to believe that they can hang on to the lead lap. You, know, you look at Casgrala, at least he was running in the top three quarters of the field. That usually isn't going to be good enough, right? We need at least close to 50%. If you want to stay on the lead lap and you don't want to go a lap down, you need a 50 right there. You need to run in the top 20, top 22 and you could possibly hang on if this thing goes green for a regular amount of time. Once you start losing laps, then it doesn't matter what strategy, it doesn't really matter how many cautions we get, you're kind of out of the picture. We really need guys that can be able to hang on to the lead lap and be within striking distance at the end to maximize those late race place differential gains, that late race finishing position gain. And my fear, and I think it's valid, is that Hemrick and Burton are going to be locked out of that. They will need pure chaos. They will need insanity. And I don't know if you necessarily need the extreme savings at the bottom with these drivers. And I think we can get some cheaper options too. We probably should just sort it based on price as opposed to rating ranks. Let's do it that way. That's where I stand right now. Obviously, you're probably going to get them starting that. I want to sort it the other way, don't I? We're obviously probably going to get those drivers starting in the very back again. And you're going to probably end up with some expensive place differential, guys. And so you will have to explore this. But I really wouldn't want to go there. I would much rather go to Justin Haley if I had to. Although Haley hasn't been great. But he's right there on the borderline of staying on the lead lap. And he pulled it off at Las Vegas. Wasn't a phenomenal day, but if there isn't any other value on the board, then Haley at 5,300 works because. So if we compare Austin Haley to some of these other value drivers, yeah, it's not going to work. But if the value ends up being really tight, which I don't necessarily expect, but if it does, it's really just Justin Haley versus this crew. And so, and we could probably throw Ryan Priest in there as well. Really, Haley doesn't have to be the best value pick on the board. Haley just has to be the best value pick among these drivers. Should he be a better point per dollar player than Ty Dillon? Yeah, I think you can check that box. Kaz, yeah. Hemrick, yeah. Burton, yeah. Zane Smith, yeah. So then it becomes a little tighter with Todd Gillen. And ultimately, what will decide that is starting position, and Todd Gillen tends to start a little bit better. Now, all things being equal, if we're not worried about starting position, which we obviously will be, but if we're just looking at finishing position and how they're running, then clearly it's going to be Todd Gilliland. He's in a better car. You're going to take a front row car over a Rick Ware car, although Rick Ware is running a lot better this season. Gilliland is a very underrated driver. He turns out top 25s every single week. He's improved some this season. And then obviously, if you look at his rating this year, 
and then say who has the best driver rating on this board based on the last five races. He's 22nd, which basically you can translate into him being the 22nd best driver. That's significantly better than Haley. However, you're going to get probably a better starting position or more place differential out of Justin Haley. And also with Haley is, so what you're typically going to run into is he's going to start closer to 20th. He's going to start closer to 30th. Gillen can have a good race, but through attrition and failures, he probably gains less spots. Whereas Haley might end up with one of these jokers, Kaz, Dan, Daniel, Burton, Zane Smith, starting in front of him. And so he gets easier place differential gains that can move forward easier. Whereas it's tougher sledding for Todd Gillen to work forward. Can he get his 26, 22nd place finish? Yes. But Haley will probably benefit from passing slower cars. Haley will benefit from mechanical failures that may not necessarily help Gillen. You know, an average decent car that's worse than Gillen might be better than Haley. So Haley benefits from, like, for example, Corey LaJoy starts behind Todd Gillen. Todd Gillen doesn't really get any benefit from that. He's going to get a, a place differential spot from that, whereas Haley will. So that's the boost there. But again, all things being equal in terms of just raw speed, you want to go with Gillen. But again, going back to the fact, Haley doesn't have to be the best value pick on the board. Your punt doesn't have to be the best punt on the board. Doesn't have to be super efficient. Just has to be better than the other punts. Same thing can be said of Gillen. Same of Priest. The issue with Priest is that he is more likely going to start even closer to the front than Todd Gillen. Now, if for whatever reason, Priest does not qualify well, then of course. It hasn't been a very good season for Priest, but it also hasn't been a very bad season. If we look at these last five races, he's a top 20 driver. We expect a little bit more. And there are some rumblings going on at SHR that they're going to sell two charters. So Ryan Priest probably needs to get it together. Chase Briscoe is more than likely safe. We don't know where the charter is going to be sold, though. I haven't really heard. Is it going to be Haas? Why would Haas sell his charters? He's got plenty of money. The, the sale is probably going to come from the Tony Stewart side, who does not have plenty of money, who has talked about changes needing to happen. And we know that Tony Stewart loves his boy, Chase Briscoe. So when the season ends and charters are being sold, he's more likely to keep him around. What's that mean for Noah? What's that mean for Priest? We don't know. But I would say there is a bit of a hot seat there for Ryan Priest, and he should be slightly concerned, and he needs to step his game up. I mean, I'm, I'm, he's probably always concerned, to be quite honest. Either way, he's there as well, 5,700. Can he hang on to the lead lap? Yes. Does he fit that mold of a value driver who can stay around, make a move at the end? Absolutely. And that's where I really want to go rather than taking a punt. That's where I was earlier this week. Just hanging in this race, hanging with all the cautions, make something work. LaJoy is not running the way that we would like to see. And I don't know if it's an overreaction on my part, but the numbers just aren't there. It is still early in the season. I wouldn't completely abandon him. But as far as the price check video goes on Friday morning, if I'm looking at the numbers and being as objective as possible, it's not really a play I want to make. His teammates have been much better. And Hosever could fit into this category with Todd Gillen and Zane Smith. They're under 6,000. He did have a good race at Texas last year for Legacy. 22nd on our board. 15th place finish at Las Vegas. Solid finishes in these races. He's finishing races. That can work. Um, again, probably the determining factor. Would imagine most of these guys have pretty similar speed. Obviously, if one unloads really quick, then we will be excited. But... The counter to that is if one of these drivers is really quick in practice, they're more than likely going to qualify inside the top 20, and that's going to make it very difficult to play those drivers. Because we're ultimately trying to benefit from the chaos, not really chaos, but the cautions at the end. And if you start in the teens and you finish in the teens, it's a great day. 
but you're more than likely not getting that big place differential boost from the nature of the racing. The only way you really get the big nature boost is from starting in the 20s. We're really looking at drivers that may not necessarily deserve the finish that they get. And when we look for undeserving drivers, we look at practice. And so instead of looking for the fast truck or car in practice, we're looking for the slower guys because they're going to qualify worse and they're going to need the nature of the Texas race to play out to hand them a good finish. Whereas the faster of these cars at the bottom will qualify better and could ultimately survive and make the right strategy moves, but they just don't get those extra gains. They don't benefit from drivers making mistakes, speeding penalties, mechanical failures, and they don't get the undeserved or the, you know, unrelated boost in fantasy. So, you know, you really, we don't even really worry about practice, to be quite honest. The research we're doing right now probably sets the tone for who we want to pick in this value range. Because like I said, if they are fast, they're going to show up at the top of the board and they're just going to be limited based on the nature of the racing. This is not a practice that I would put in place at another track, but giving my thoughts on the cautions at Texas, kind of not looking for speed. What I want is just enough speed. And I can tell you who has just enough speed based on these data points. I want you to hang on to the lead lap. I don't really want you to qualify that well. And I actually wouldn't mind you being slow in practice and your lap by lap data, which you can get at raceforthepriced.com, Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. Like and subscribe if you have it. We're monetized, baby. Super chats incoming. Live show Friday night. Big things happening. Bad news for my enemies. Here we go. So the data is right there for me. And I hope that practice data skews people in one direction. I hope that people think that this is going to be a green flag race. And I hope that people think Texas is a fun whatever. I don't think it's bad. Because I'm happy to do the early week research. I'm happy to follow the larger sample size of what these drivers have done this season. And I know I'm looking at Las Vegas, Phoenix, Bristol, Richmond, Martinsville. And they're all different tracks. But <clears throat> if a team can set up for these different tracks, then and adjust for these different tracks and continuously produce the results that they produce, then I don't see why you couldn't trust that they're going to show up at Texas and put together what they've already put together. I know, look, it would be great if we had five intermediate tracks in a row in the same baggage, but then it wouldn't be because then the algorithms could absolutely just hammer on this. So anyway. I'm happy looking at these numbers and saying these are the guys that I want to go to and I will chase place differential and I will chase bad practices. And you say, well, that's a bad practice to chase bad practice. I think it's a good practice in terms of research to chase bad practice this week. Write that one down, folks. All right, so we don't have any data on Austin Hill. Ricky Stenhouse Jr., his finishes have been worse than his running position, which says a lot, because right now his running position is 27th on the board. He hasn't been terrible. He has been consistently underperforming. Is he that far off? No, but I mean, when we're on the borderline of getting on that lead lap, he's on the wrong side. But he's not that far from the wrong side, and he's going to scare people away. And he's only 6,100. And maybe he goes overlooked. Maybe people don't trust him. But he's a perfect example last year of him getting a finish of ninth. When we go and look at that race, and we see what his average running position was. And his average running position was 23rd. There it is, folks. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to completely replicate last year's race. But I don't believe it's going to be that far off. He played strategy games. He made it work. It may not be him again. Maybe it's Justin Haley, whose average running position was 22nd, finished 13th. He's done this a couple times. We have plenty of drivers here who had significantly lower average running positions and much better finishing positions. You even got BJ McLeod, 32 to 22. You didn't need the extreme savings, but it was there. 
and this wasn't necessarily all of the cars got tore up although there were plenty of wrecks you're just getting a lot of things switching around with plenty of cautions changing the order changing the grid people doing different things and when you add that element it opens the door I've been wrong on Stenhouse plenty of times this year, thinking he could stand the lead lap and benefit and make things work. And you say, all right, well, at some point, you got to cut your losses. That's true. But I believe you got to hang on for one more week. If there's a race where that strategy can play out for him and for you in DFS, it would be this week. Michael McDowell, slightly better of an upgrade. Has he been awesome this year? No, he has not. But has he been a front row motorsports truck? Yeah, he has. His rating rank ranks 24th in the field. His average driver rating over the last five is 21st. So that puts him at the 24th best driver in the field. But he's running in 21st. I get it. It's a step down from what we have expected from McDowell over the last couple seasons. We want him to keep getting better. But guess what? The field keeps getting better. There, you know, growth and development is not linear. You take a step forward, you take a step backwards. This idea that Michael McDowell and Front Row Motorsports are going to just keep getting better every year, and then all of a sudden they're going to be championship contenders. What are we doing? I would argue that McDowell probably hit his ceiling last year, and maybe they've taken a little bit of a step back, and then other teams took a big step forward, and that's slowed them down to where they're running. And like it's not like this car turned into garbage or McDowell's not good anymore. He did have a 12th best driver rating of Phoenix. You know, take whatever you want from Bristol. It's up to you to decide. Sure, hasn't been a good season. The numbers aren't great. But he's not dead in the water. And he's been given a dead in the water price tag at 6200 He has been good at Texas in the past. And I hope... And I would expect this is another place where people are going to overreact and say, oh, McDowell sucks. And that is subjective and that's biased. I'm not a Michael McDowell homer by any means. What I believe is happening in the industry and probably among DFS players is you've seen what McDowell's done over the last couple of years. He's not living up to that standard. And so your next line of reasoning is he's dead. Step back and really think about that. We've been racing at a bunch of different racetracks. And as I explained, you know, there's plenty of reason why his numbers just aren't that good this year. Do you think that front row has lost it? I mean, at the beginning of the season, we were talking about how Ford and front row had really stepped their alliance up. Ford declared them as a top tier team. Front row has stronger connections than ever with RFK. Front row was qualifying up front to start the season. Did we forget about all of those things just because a couple of races haven't gone his way? And you're disappointed that his driver rating is 21st. What do you want it to be? Size him up against the rest of the field. What is a legitimate expectation for this front row car? It's not that far off, folks. And to get him at 6,200 and have success at this track in the past. Now, the only thing that would doom this pick is if he starts near the front. One of the things that we kind of can lean on, it seems like, is that we're probably going to get Stenhouse starting closer to the back. Austin Dillon. The track history checks out at 6,300. You love it. Although this win was goofy, but whatever. Win's a win. I'm not going to hate on Austin Dillon. Driver rating 29 over the last five, excluding Coda. That really tells us everything we need to know. It's just not working out right now. Change crew chiefs, it's not working out. It never has worked out. He's going to be running forever. Doesn't matter. Grandfather won't fire him. His grandfather won't transition him into a management role, although that's what Dale Jr. said likely should have happened last season. Austin's not ready to let go. And this looks like a driver, not ready to let go. Again, 6,300 for an RCR car. Oh, that's interesting. With good Texas success. But man, this looks like a guy in his last leg. You've changed crew chiefs for the 40th time. When do we say enough's enough? 
And as a DFS player, I'm willing to say, boy, I want to have a really hard time going to that play. And then when you look at and see what his teammates are doing, Kyle Bush struggling, yeah, that's really RCR is just in a bad spot. Uh, whether they are on the decline, everyone got better this year, and they did not. And so maybe you know they hold held steady, but every team has leapfrogged them, and that's why they are where they are. Austin Cindric at sixty four hundred. These are the value plays that I really could consider that can hang on the lead lap. Probably not an Austin Dillon, but these drivers should be able to hang on the lead lap, benefit at the end. Cindric, another Austin, having a miserable season, but he's piecing it together lately. Top 25s in his last three. He was a top, we probably can discount the Coda race, but top 25 driver rating in his last two. I know this track's going to be completely different. But if you really wanted to go to Las Vegas, you could see that he at least had a top 25 car there. It is a Penske Ford. And overall, we have seen some improvement with the Penske Fords over the last couple of weeks. Again, though, the package is going to change. So they could regress. It's always a possibility. I don't love the play. But I don't think anyone else loves the play. I mean, I'm not in love with any of these guys. But they do provide a lot of savings. And so... It really depends on where we get qualifying position for them, for our punts. But these drivers are more likely to stay on the lead lap and really benefit from the carnage that could unfold, or at least just the, the chess match that could unfold. Nima checks there. We already talked about Jimmy Johnson. Josh Berry running halfway decent. 16th driver rating over these last races. Kind of getting there, but I don't think he provides quite the savings I would like. I would much rather go to Eric Jones, who has experienced success in multiple different cars at this track. He's shown speed at times. His Toyota seems to be a little bit better than John Hunter Nemechek's. Had a really good race last season at Texas. It didn't work out for him. He was up front at the very end. He was one of those cars collected. So I definitely can go to Eric Jones in this situation. Because of his upside, Daniel Suarez, another driver that I am interested in because if you look at his Texas results, they're very strong. If you look at similar races like uh, Nashville, which I know some people may not be on board with comparing that, but I like looking at Nashville and Dover in terms of setups. Suarez has been very good at that track as well. I believe Trackhouse has a setup that can work. And we see that with Ross Chastain. And so at 7,200, this seems like a pretty cheap discount for a track house car and we don't really need him to dominate again it's gonna come down to strategy which we know track house will play those games as well we just need him to have a top 15 car and then maybe make some moves at the end because whereas these drivers could get you know the place differential boost into the top 15 you can make a sound argument that suarez and jones playing two tire strategies running long which uh, jones did run long once or, or stayed out to get track position you get track position at texas you're in clean air and then the cautions come at the right time then everybody's pitting again and now all of a sudden you've locked yourself into the top five position in clean air for the rest of the race if things play out right that's that's the thing that i keep hammering on not whether this is going to be a wreck fest or not but do we get cautions? When do we get cautions? And the opportunities that the cautions present. And I believe the nature of the racing and the track is going to provide opportunities to pit and to go with a different strategy. And let's say you stay out and you get clean air. And then 10 laps later, there's another caution. You held your spot. Everybody hits pit road again. And now you are, you went from a 20th place car to playing games to get in the top five. But now the caution again felt the right time. Now you're on four tires in the top five. The world is your oyster. And that can work out for a Jones. And that can work out for a Suarez. I don't necessarily see a Stenhouse Dillon or those guys really getting up that top five situation. But they definitely can benefit from the cautions at the end to get them to a top 15. And that's why I like these drivers right here. Again, laboring the point. Because I know people, oh, he says it's going to be a wreck fast. I believe there'll be cautions. 
enough cautions that stagger the racing and prevent strategy opportunities that are going to open the door for value and the middle tier to get finishes that they deserve or they don't deserve, whatever word you want to use, but that will surprise some DFS players that will surprise the normal fantasy viewer or a regular NASCAR viewer. Right? I'm not saying this is going to be a Daytona. This is going to be a 30 car pileup. But it doesn't matter. I'm going to clarify things. You, and thank you for joining me and being part of this team and being a part of this crew and subscribing to the channel. You get it. You're one of us. You listen to what I say. You appreciate me. And I appreciate you and all the support that you give. Other people that pop in here and troll take my words and twist them and uh, just outright make up falsehoods. It's fine. It's fine. We're monetized now. We're growing now. This baby's good. Keeps positive vibes going. Someone hitting big this week. Chase Briscoe, basically a top 15 driver. He fits that mold of Suarez and Jones. Chris Busher, too cheap. Texan, never really done that well at his racetrack, but could get back on track this weekend. You know that they have top 10 speed. Solid finishes here. Finishing better than where he's running. It's fine. We'll take it. We're talking strategy. We're talking RFK, right? Brakazowski, Chris Busher. You, you want to talk two-tire BK? That's what he is. Two-tire Brad. There's got to be a better way of saying that. No tire, bro. I don't know. Two tire BK. Eh, whatever. Either way, RFK will play games and make gains. And at this price tag, I am very much excited. And I believe it will be easy to work them into a lot of lineups. Maybe Brad's the fourth guy in. Maybe he's your fifth guy in if you're doing a value play and you got four big dogs. It works. It absolutely does. I mean, you sandwich in Brad and Jones. A lot of ways that you can go. And we'll play around with building here in a bit. Ty Gibbs, 8,500. Rating rank. Average is 10th. That makes him the fifth best driver in this field. You're getting him at 8,500. Sure. I skipped over Alex Bowman because Bowman is, while he is improving, He's still just been that 15th and back guy. Again, he could play games as well and try to do strategy to get back on the map. And that's fine. So you can't completely eliminate him. But if we're just talking about speed and who's running well, who could also play games or even doesn't have to play games, it's Ty Gibbs. Bubba Wallace finished third last season. Fast race car, obviously 37 aggressive driver we like to see that when we want fast laps and laps led that's fine plug him in but we also know the downside of an aggressive driver at texas Logano's run well here in the past and i'm not going to spend too much time looking at these guys at the top because you know the guys at the top i will say kyle bush is not something that i really want to explore although you know he sold his energy drinks he sold his team he's focused on family and racing and one would expect, all right, Bush is just racing now. He's running Xfinity truck and cup. Folks on family. You should get the best version of Bush. That being said, his car's is not that good. I mean, it's just not there. So you're getting the best out of Bush in theory, and you're getting nothing in terms of finishing position. Ross Chastain, aggressive driver who could be aggressive on restarts, make gains, go into the lane that no one else wants to go into, pick up some spots, play games on pit road, has been fast in Texas, won at Nashville, was really good at Dover, pretty much checks every single one of my boxes, and he is on the cheaper end. Like that play. Same can be said for Chas, 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 Chase Elliott who is steadily improving, fifth at Richmond, third at Martinsville. I mean, here's a spoiler. Might be a shock to some. We look at these last five races. Or actually, we're looking at the yeah, last five races. Martinsville, Richmond, Bristol, Phoenix, Las Vegas. And we take the average driver rating and we sort it out. His is eighth. An average driver rating of eighth. 
in that field, when we size everybody up, he's been the fourth best driver. He's right there. He is knocking on the door. Hendrick is closing the gap. And in reality, the gap might not even be existent this week when we consider we're going back to the intermediate track package where Kyle Larson just won with a Hendrick car, where Hendrick was great last season. And when we talk about Nashville, he's a winner there. Dover, awesome at Dover. Pretty good at Bristol if you really want to lean heavy into the concrete. Elliot is on board. He has been on the board the last couple of weeks. Forget about whatever last season was and early this season. He's right back in the conversation. All the JGR Toyotas are in the conversation. All, except for Bowman, the Hendrick cars are in the conversation. And then this week, you really got to lean into Logano and Blaney. Got to open the door to Ross Chastain. They are all possible hogs slash dominators. And I know your first reaction is going to be, that's too many guys. They all can't be contenders this week. They all can't run fast laps. We usually talk about three or four. And you are right. And I know it seems lazy or like, like I'm not doing my homework and my research or I'm being wishy-washy to say that there is almost 10 drivers that you could circle it around in terms of laps led. And you're going to say, well, one guy ran away with it. And you're going to tell me there's going to be 10 guys this week? Yeah, because if you go back and look at 22 and you say, all right, yeah. If we get cautions and if we get strategy plays, then yes, there really is the opportunity for many drivers to lead laps. There's the opportunity for many drivers to run fast laps. You know, I know people are going to say, oh, no, we can get green flag runs. That's also under the assumption that Kyle Larson is going to nail every restart. And he did nail every restart until the last restart, and then he didn't nail it. And so if we get a little bit more chaos and aggressive driving on the restarts, then yeah, we are going to see the lead change hands. And if we have two tires, four tires, no tires, we're going to see the lead change hands. It's going to create opportunities. And maybe by taking that resin off, we could run into tire issues again. Who knows how this track is going to race without the resin in that second groove. We could have more tire failures. And, I mean, the teams don't know what's going to happen. And that leads to more cautions. So, I mean, I really don't need to tell you that these drivers have been running well. You can see on your screen, you know who's been the top guys. Let's build some lineups. What do you say? I know it's silly to build lineups on Friday morning. And if you want to exit out, that's fine. Like, subscribe, share, recruit more people over to this. I, I really... Love that you guys have just chose my channel. Maybe you still have other channels too, but now you're starting to come over here more. It's great. I'm really glad to have you. Any way I can help out, comments, DMs, I'm here for you. But yeah, it's silly to do this build, but come on, man. Who cares? Why are we taking it so seriously? Why are we taking content so seriously? It's just a video. If you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. Maybe you're in your car. you got time to kill. Maybe you're sitting in your office and you've already watched Rogan's podcast and there's nothing left there. So you're going to watch me build some lineups early Friday morning. Let's have some fun. So we'll start. Uh, we'll throw in, let's just throw in two hogs or dominators. And you start from there and we have 71, 25 left. Let's go down. Let's do the build with the cheapest guy possible we'll go with justin haley i mean there are cheaper options but he seems the best of the very bottom <clears throat> and now we've got 77.3 and i don't mind that at all widen this out a little bit there's a couple guys in the 7,000 range that we like we look over here now if you're looking at the screen the value place again remember that i have a place setter projection in and we're really only looking at finishing position, although I did put in some hog points or dominator points for the top guys. When we look at these value drivers, it's simply just looking at finishing position. We don't have a place differential measure. 
So clearly the drivers that are going to finish the best or project that have the highest upside in terms of finishing position are going to be up here. And then it kind of gives you a point per dollar perspective on them. And the value is these are really only guys under 7,000. So I got to come over here to look at our 7K drivers. And at 7K, we can get, we'll go Eric Jones. Fly over here. That gives me 8.1. That can give me, now as you know, spare you the long story. I know other DFS providers put the entire lineup on the screen. More power to them. I cannot, I will not because of the attacks that have come my way in the past. So probably won't happen again, but I just always play it safe. I'm not going down that route. So if I got a 100, that means I can take the RFK boys or I can go down to Chase, probably go up one. Let's see if I take Chase. That gets me up to 85. And from 85, I can give Ty Gibbs. That's a pretty solid lineup. But what if I want to really ex expend? Spend on three big guys. Mm, so I think I'm going to have to downgrade Briscoe into the 6K range. So I got Hamlin and Larson jammed in. Let's go with another expensive option. And just stick with... You know, one of our best pit row guys that could cycle to the lead and get you a chunk of fast lap points. Maybe not dominate the race. Wait, not him. We'll take, we'll take Truex for this scenario. But again, as succinctly as I can say it, dominated points, yes, there are races where tr races are dominated by a driver. And you could argue that Kyle Larson dominated the Texas race last year, but domination really didn't matter. He still did not finish with a great race. And so saying he was a dominator, but then didn't even get into the fantasy lineup. It's just not the best use of vocabulary. It's just not an efficient way of communicating with your audience and really understanding the nuance of DFS. That's why I say Hulk points, because Hulk points just tells you that they led laps, they run fast laps. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were dominant or not dominant. They could have cycled to the lead two tire four tire strategy the race played out for them they had a good race car but it doesn't mean that they were head and shoulders above the field and when you use dominator every single week you imply that someone's head and shoulders above the field every single week and that's just not the case so i use hollow points there it was <laughs> anyway we just need heart true x not to be the best but to be the best for a certain moment of the race especially at 9700 just during a sequence of the race and we can count on him possibly for a top five if the race does go green and we love these two guys. If you want to hedge a little bit more, look, there can be long green flag runs and there can be caution scenarios. Both of those can be simultaneously true. And you can build for both. If Larson doesn't wreck at the end, you still have enough cautions at the end that lead to Ricky Stenhouse being in the optimal lineup. You still have enough circumstances and pit road sequences that we get drivers that get undeserved finishes and still. The driver that leads the most laps and is quote unquote dominant ends up in the optimal line, but as long as he doesn't wreck into bubble walls. So those things can both happen. And it can also happen that the guy on the long green flag runs, it doesn't work out for. But let's say that it does. And you can also get the scenario where I'm completely wrong and we do not get any cautions and it's completely green the entire time. So if it's completely green the entire time, definitely favors a Larson who's had speed and has been speed on long running green flag runs this year and in this racetrack. Martin Truex Jr. is well known for being a very good long run speed driver. So in that scenario, they work. In the scenario where we get green and we get yellow, they both work. And again, in 9700, we may not necessarily need him to absolutely crush. So looking at this build, we got 67.5, plenty of options. We've got all those 6K guys that I've already talked about that we can go to. You can go to Stenhouse. You can go to McDowell. You can get risky with the Austins. You can go Gillen. If we go cheap with Priest, how high can we go? We can get up to 78. 
And that gives us Briscoe. We like it. I'm not saying Bra uh, Then we got Suarez and we got Jones. Like all three of those drivers, because they're just a cut above the 6K drivers who I believe can hang on to the lead lap, get 15, maybe 10. But I really feel strongly that Suarez can have a top 10 day, maybe knock on the door of the top five. Same for Jones, same for Briscoe. If I go a little bit cheaper, I might be able to get the Chris Busher. And really, this is opening a lot of doors because we don't know where our starting position is. And ultimately, some of the decisions that will be made will be made on that place differential consideration. And we got Haley locked in here. And we're going to want to try to build without Haley here in a second. If we go get a little no, we can't quite get there. We just miss out on getting up to Chris Busher. Now you could obviously tweak these guys at the top. Obviously, if you want to get rid of Truex and go with uh, Ross Chastain, who I think is probably a little cheaper. Now we can get it to Brad Kozlowski. And Brad Kozlowski has not been qualifying that well. He gets an undeserved finish. Although like he has a top 10 car, but he boosts up in the top five, plays differential. Once he's boosted in the top five, maybe scrapes a couple fast laps. I don't mind that at all, but I really am not crazy about going with this double punt. I don't know if you're going to be able to maximize points out of Gill and Haley. I can play Haley. I can get behind Haley. We did see him in previous races this year be off, and we'll just by getting enough points and being the one punt that didn't fail. Fine with that. But then to ask for another one of these guys to really come through, it's pretty tough. It's just not a high probability. The scenario is there, the circumstances are there. It'll be more of a question when we see qualifying position. It'll be easier not to play both if one of them starts close to the front. Let's get out of the Haley range and let's try to build with two 6K drivers.